Hello, it's us again. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure we talked about the thyroid in the past. We've probably like pointed at it and stuff, but apparently we haven't talked about the anatomy of the thyroid gland before. Well, that's easily remedied. Or is it? Because I'm probably gonna have to get a microscope out. All right, thyroid gland, where is it? What does it do, you know, like really vaguely? Um, blood supply, does it get any innovation? Uh, and if we're gonna talk about the thyroid gland, we need to talk about the parathyroid glands at the same time, because they're right there, and they're gonna be sharing all that blood supply innovation. Um, and we should talk about structures nearby, because there are a few important points there, right? Well, here it is, so that's the easy bit. Um, thri thrios. Uh, a Greek word, threos and eidos, meaning shapes. So threos refers to a shield. This is the thyroid cartilage here. This is that prominent bit of cartilage you can feel there forming the laryngeal prominence or the Adam's apple. So shield shaped describes the thyroid cartilage. Nearby is this gland. So this gland gets called the thyroid gland. Um, the two are separate, they don't, they're not really functionally related. The thyroid cartilage is part of the larynx, it's part of the airway. The thyroid gland is involved in metabolism, if you wanted to use one word. Um, and we can see that in fact here, the thyroid gland is a little inferior to the thyroid cartilage. And it's in fact, most of the, the gland you can see has got two lobes. So most of the gland is actually spread laterally. And if you imagine that deep to the thyroid gland here, we've got the trachea. And then this lump here is the cricoid cartilage. We've got the thyroid cricoid. Cricoid cartilage, thyroid cartilage. So in fact, the two lobes of the thyroid gland in most people are a little lateral to the airway, to the trachea and the cricoid cartilage. And then we have this central isthmus, this joining bit linking the two lobes together, which overlaps the, the trachea, those cartilaginous rings of the trachea, which is why, oh no, you, yeah, you can, you, you can palpate all this, right? You can palpate all these cartilaginous bits. Um, but, the thyroid gland actually starts off in the tongue. So in the, in the embryo, the thyroid gland begins to form here. And it leaves this little depression in the posterior part of the tongue called the foramen cecum. And it descends in the developing embryo to its final location. This is interesting because it means that some people might have bits of thyroid tissue in unexpected places, so ectopic thyroid tissue. And there's often a, something that gets called a pyramidal lobe here, like a sticky up pointy bit of thyroid tissue. And it's not, you know, it's uncommon, but I think it's maybe 10% of the population, something like that have it. So it's, you know, it's uncommon, but it's not super rare. So you might find some thyroid tissue extending up here. And what that's doing is, is, is showing you how the thyroid tissue descended to its adult location. And some of it didn't get all of the way. The other thing that happens is that the thyroid gland, as it descends, it trails a duct, a tube between the posterior tongue and the descending thyroid tissue. And normally that thyroglossal duct gets obliterated, destroyed, it closes up and disappears. But in some people, bits of the thyroglossal duct might persist um, and they might kind of fill with fluid. So if you find a midline mobile cyst, maybe it's a thyroglossal cyst, maybe it's a remnant of the thyroglossal duct, which is just filled with fluid and forms a cyst. So the larynx describes a bunch of structures adjacent to the thyroid uh, and the trachea. Um, the one thing on here which I can't show you, I'm really not that fussed about showing you, are the strap muscles of the neck. So there are a load of strap muscles, thin flat muscles covering all these things. And what we've had to do here is remove sternohyoid and sternothyroid, two strap muscles on either side. So they're going from the sternum to the hyoid, which is up here, 
and so remove those to see the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland is deep to a couple of strap muscles. Um, and the other bit of structure to it is that it's got a thin capsule um, and it's within the visceral component of the fascia of the neck. So it's in this pretracheal um, region that we talked about when we looked at the fascia of the neck. Blood supply. And the blood supply is interesting because what we've got here is we've got a, you know, a relatively diddy little gland, but it's got a big blood supply. And in fact, on here, we can only see parts of it. Peasy to remember what we've got because we've got the superior thyroid artery and the inferior thyroid artery. We can see that the superior thyroid artery is dropping down here. It's a branch of, can you see where we are? The external carotid artery. So common carotid artery is dividing here into external and internal carotid arteries. So the superior thyroid artery is one of the first branches of the external carotid artery. Now what we can't see, because it, it would be tricky to show on a model, is that the inferior thyroid artery is coming up from inferiorly. Now over here we've got the subclavian artery going out that way. Oh yeah, we can see that one going that way. The subclavian artery has a thyrocervical trunk popping off it around here in the neck. Thyrocervical. So that's going to give branches off to the thyroid gland, namely that inferior thyroid artery, and branches to the neck. That's the cervical bit. There is another artery that gets described. It's called the, um, the thyroid imma artery, Im I M A. I don't think there's ever an artery I've discussed with anybody. But um, this artery um, is again uncommon tends to branch from the brachiocephalic trunk, sometimes it comes from other places like the arch of the aorta, and it runs up the trachea in the midline to run to the, to the uh, thyroid gland. So that's another thing that gets mentioned. Um, and that's it. Now, why has the thyroid gland got such a rich blood supply? Well, it's because it's, it's, it's hormonal. So most of the cells in the thyroid gland are making hormones, they're making um, we'll get referred to as T3 and T4, so um, triiodothyronine and uh, tetraiodothyronine, which tends to get called thyroxine. I think that's right. There's a huge amount of physiology here, and the production is driven by hormones produced in the pituitary gland, namely thyroid stimulating hormones. So there are hormonal feedback loops controlling all this. Now, the hormones made by the thyroid gland are involved in regulating metabolism, regulating energy use by pretty much all the cells in the body. Um, they're really important in growth and development in the fetus and in children. Um, uh, they, they affect carbohydrate uptake in the gut, they affect uh, heat production and, and that sort of thing. Right? So that, that's the role of the thyroid gland, is to chuck out hormones that affect a huge number of cells in the body to do all of those things. That's why they're so vascular. So those cells making the T3 and T4 hormones are the follicular cells, so there are follicles. If we have a look under the microscope, we can see a little bit of this, but you've got to imagine here because you've got sections cut through, but you've got blobs, right, blobs of colloid, stored stuff within the thyroid gland, and those are surrounded by um, follicular cells who are making follicles, so there are balls in there. So the follicular cells are making the thyroid hormones and they're making those hormones from iodine and tyrosine, the amino acid. So the follicular cells are doing most of the work. Now there are also occasional parafollicular cells, which we're probably not going to spot under the microscope. But these occasional parafollicular cells have got a completely different job. They're making calcitonin. And calcitonin reduces blood calcium levels. Calcium in your blood is crucial for all sorts of cellular activity. Um, so the, maintaining the right amount of calcium in your blood at all times is a good thing. Th parafollicular cells in the thyroid gland make calcitonin, which encourages cells to take calcium out of the blood. So that's what we see in the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland is an endocrine organ. It's making hormones to put into the blood to affect cells around the body. So blood, 
goes into the thyroid glands through those two arteries. Now it comes out through three veins on either side. We can see only one here. Um, but if we take this off, we can see where they drain to. Now we have superior, middle and inferior thyroid veins. Still very straightforward. So I can't demonstrate all of the thyroid veins on here, but it's not a big deal. I'll show you why. Now you can see the big blood vessels here. We've got the, the internal jugular vein draining down here. And we've got the two brachiocephalic veins here, superior vena cava. So the superior and middle thyroid veins drain to the internal jugular vein. And the inferior thyroid veins, which we're kind of seeing here, drain to the brachiocephalic vein. Veins being veins, there is some variety here um, and what have you. Ooh, another note about the arteries is that because the superior and inferior thyroid arteries come from two different arteries, so they come from the, the external carotid artery and the subclavian artery, they anastomose quite happily within the thyroid gland, meaning there's a collateral circulation here between the external carotid artery and the subclavian artery. Innervation. Well, um, there is sympathetic innervation to the thyroid gland. Um, I've seen that described in a number of places. There are cervical sympathetic ganglia up in the neck. So the, 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 the sympathetic trunk, the sympathetic chain continues up into the neck. Sympathetic fibres jump onto the arteries and follow the arteries into the thyroid gland. Does it matter? These sympathetic fibres are vasomotor, not secretomotor. So what I'm saying is, is that these can affect the dilation of the artery, so they can affect the blood flow to the thyroid gland, but they're not going to trigger the thyroid gland to make more stuff. The secretion of hormones from the thyroid gland and the production of hormones is controlled by the pituitary gland. So it's under hormonal control, not nervous control. Lymphatic drainage, we're in the neck. There are loads of lymph nodes nearby. Look, we've got the trachea here, so we've got paratracheal lymph nodes and all sorts. Essentially, lymph from the thyroid gland is gonna drain pretty much to any and every nearby lymph node, all right? Keep it simple. Thyroid gland done, I think, right? Yeah, bit of blue tack from last week. Parathyroid glands. Now the parathyroid glands are worth talking about, not just because they're here, um, but because they share a lot of the stuff we've been talking about. Okay, these are probably a little bit, right, here we go. See, this is from here, we've got tongue and stuff. Thyroid gland here. Um, and the parathyroid glands are kind of on the, that's a bit, that is a bit big. It's a bit of a generous thyroid, uh, parathyroid gland, that. The parathyroid glands are on the kind of posterior surface of the thyroid gland. And there is a superior one, and it, yeah, it's still a bit big probably. A superior one and an inferior one on either side. In life, they're kind of browny soft, you know, not, not dissimilar to that shape, but they're kind of brown shaped. Um, and they're outside of that thin capsule of the thyroid gland, but they're sat on top of it. So the blood supply to the parathyroid glands and the innervation is the same as the thyroid gland, the same things are getting there, right? So there are four parathyroid glands, two on either side, superior and inferior. Now the parathyroid glands, the cells in there, which get called chief cells, don't they? They make parathyroid hormone. So parathyroid hormone, this is the cool bit, right? Parathyroid hormone um, raises the level of blood calcium. So it works in opposition to the calcitonin in the thyroid gland. And yet the thyroid gland is supposed to be doing this other job of regulating metabolism and stuff. Isn't that, it, why don't we, why, why don't you just have, anyway. Um, so parathyroid hormone works by then encouraging osteoclasts in the bone to release calcium from the bone, because that's where you store your calcium, and put it back into the blood. It encourages the kidney to reabsorb more calcium so you keep hold of your calcium. It encourages production of an active, 
an active form of vitamin D3 that encourages the small intestine to absorb more uh, calcium and that sort of thing. Parathyroid hormone, parathyroid glands increase blood calcium levels. Calcitonin made by the parafollicular cells in the thyroid gland cause a decrease in blood calcium and they work together to keep your blood calcium levels just right so all your cells are really happy and they can, they can do their thing. Isn't that neat? The parathyroid glands can be a little bit variable in their position. They also descend in the developing neck, in the, but that's a story for another day, right? Um, what we've covered are the pertinent parts of the anatomy of the thyroid and the parathyroid glands. Location, function, within reason, nearby structure, oh, nearby structures, I almost forgot one. Um, blood supply, venous drainage, innovation, that sort of thing, right the big nearby structure. So if we've got the thyroid gland, here are the laryngeal cartilages and here's the trachea, the big nearby structure is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now the recurrent laryngeal nerve is a branch of the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is, is running down the neck because it's running with these guys and then it dives to try and get to the esophagus so we can get to the GI tract and get down here and that sort of thing, right? It gives off a number of branches as it goes. One of those branches is, is the recurrent laryngeal nerve and again because of some really Really cool embryology which is a story for another day. Your recurrent laryngeal nerve um, on the left loops around the arch of the aorta and then goes back up so it ascends with the trachea laterally and on the right it loops around the right subclavian artery uh, and then loops and then passes back up it ascends to the larynx with the trachea. The recurrent laryngeal nerve's main job is to innervate all of the intrinsic muscles of the larynx, which I'm using to speak with and control my voice and that sort of thing, right? Um, and it's running kind of posterior to the thyroid gland. So any surgery on the thyroid gland, any operation working in this area, or the parathyroid glands, I guess, has a risk of damaging the recurrent laryngeal nerves. You must be aware of the path of the recurrent laryngeal nerve so that you don't damage it if you're removing thyroid tissue or something like that. You can see where it runs there, right? Whew, almost forgot that, that would have been embarrassing, right? Um, that's the anatomy of the thyroid gland, parathyroid glands and nearby structures that are worth talking about today, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay, see you guys next week.